Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CircuitPython Weekly for October 26th, 2020. This is the time of the week that we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Katni, and I am sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so support them by purchasing hardware from adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. If the meeting time is changed, we'll notify you via Discord. If you wish to be notified about changes to the meeting, we can add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is also a calendar available that we try to keep updated if you'd like to subscribe to that. This meeting is recorded. We record the audio from the voice channel and video of the text channel. If you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you are still welcome to participate. The video of this meeting is posted to YouTube and the audio is released as a podcast. If you find the podcast is not available on your favorite podcast service, please let us know. There is a notes document to accompany the meeting and recording. If you wish to participate but you don't have a microphone or you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you can add your updates to the notes doc and we'll read them off as we get to you. As well, if you wish to participate but you can't make the meeting, you can leave hug reports and status updates for us and we'll read them off during the meeting. The notes document also contains timestamps to go along with the video so you can use the document to skip around the video to the parts that interest you most. If you're just listening in, let us know that you're lurking and we'll skip over you. Uh, and please add your name to the notes doc with lurking after it if you can do that. Otherwise, let us know in the text channel and we'll get it updated. Um, it's important that the lurking status be in the notes doc because that's what we use uh, when we go through the round robin sections of the meeting. If you wish to speak in the meeting, you will need to be added to the circuit Pythonistas role. Please ask anyone in the meeting who is an admin or moderator on Discord to add you to the role if you are not already a member. If you don't want to be added to the role, you can still participate as text only. Please let us know. This meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news. Uh, this is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, libraries, and Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we're all up to. Third part is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing in the community, um, or around, or wherever. Uh, it, we take the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community uh, in this section. It's held as a round robin where I will begin uh, as an example and then I'll go through the list alphabetically looping back to the top to give everyone who wants to a chance to participate. If you're lurking I'll skip over you. If you're text only or missing the meeting I'll read your notes uh, when I get to you in the list. Status updates is next. Uh, it is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to. Take a couple minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. It's also an opportunity for folks to provide tips and tricks in response to other folks' status updates. This section is also held in a round robin to give everyone a chance to participate. Again, if you're lurking, I'll skip over you. And if you're text only or missing the meeting and have notes in the document, I will read them off. The fifth part is in the weeds. In the weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time is too long for status updates. If you have an in the weeds topic now, please add it to the notes document along with your name in the in the weeds section. And if you think of them during the meeting, please add them as you come up with them. This way we're not waiting at the end to see if anyone has anything to discuss. When we get to in the weeds, we'll turn it over to whomever has added the topic to begin the discussion. If you're text only, please make a note of it so that I can read it off. And that covers all the sections of the meeting. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started with community news. First up, a VS Code plugin for CircuitPython workflow. Joe DeVivo has released a free plugin for the Microsoft VS Code editor, which is also free, to bring the entire CircuitPython workflow into a single place within the editor, VS Code-CircuitPython. It includes a library manager, serial console, and autocomplete. Uh, links are available. Um, Learn about data science and coding with Faye from Over the Moon. 
Uh, inspired by the new Netflix original, Over the Moon, Microsoft is launching three new Microsoft Learn modules that guide learners through the beginning concepts of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Uh, Explore Space with Over the Moon Learning Path includes three parts. Plan a moon mission using the Python Pandas library, predict meteor showers using Python and VC code, and use AI to recognize objects and images using Azure Custom Vision. Uh, next up is a hand sanitizer use counter. Teacher Sean Tibor set up an Adafruit, Mat Adafruit matrix portal driving an LED matrix to display the times a hand sanitizer unit is used during the current and prior days. Available on Twitter. Uh, next is a rainbow birthday card with CircuitPython. Twitter user Chardain built a beautiful Maplewood birthday wish box. The outside had cutouts of leaves done by a Glowforge laser cutter. Inside used an Adafruit Itsy Bitsy M4 Express board and NeoPixel lights making rainbow patterns using CircuitPython code. So this is all a preview of the CircuitPython weekly newsletter, which is a CircuitPython community run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available online. Uh, at adafruitdaily.com. It highlights the latest Python on hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub, uh, which is available, um, there's a link in the notes, and you can submit a pull request, or you can tag um, at under, an underscore engineer on Twitter, or email anb at adafruit.com. Uh, with your links to your projects or um, any kind of news that you would like to see in the newsletter. And that is community news. Next up is the state of circuit Python libraries and Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the project uh, covers um, covers everything uh, by the numbers and gives us a chance to see the health of the project. Uh, outside of the topics that we are um, currently working on. I'll talk about the project overall, then I'll turn it over to Scott to talk about the core, I will talk about the libraries, and if Melissa's machine is back up, um, I will turn it over to her to talk about Blinka. Excellent, so I will be turning it over to Melissa to talk about Blinka, but first up, we will talk about the project overall. So overall, we had 18 pull requests merged by 14 authors, including some names I haven't seen, uh, Shadowclaw, Senuros, Similar, Sailor, Carson McDonald, a lot of people I haven't seen, uh, Zero, M. Gerter, One, I believe are all new names, um, at least to me. So that's excellent to see, at least um, almost half the people were new. Uh, I don't know that we've ever seen um, that ratio. So, and we had seven reviewers. So thank you to everybody who participated uh, in our poll requests for this week. We had 15 closed issues by seven people and 13 open by 12 people. And we currently have the Hacktoberfest label assigned to 27 issues, which means we have across the whole project 27 good first issues. And with that, I will turn it over to Scott to talk about the core. Hello. Okay, for the core, we had two pull requests merged from two different authors, Senoros and Arnjadur, um, from two reviewers, myself and Jeff. So thank you to everybody who contributed. Um, as always, we're we're looking for more reviewers. So if you want to help uh, increase the number of authors, uh, reviewing is a great way to do it. Um, we have 16 open pull requests. A lot of those are new, which is pretty good. Um, there's a couple that are around or above 100, 100 days old. So we should just take a look at those and see if we want to leave those open, uh, polish them up, get them in, that sort of thing. Issue wise, we had two closed issues by two people and four open by four people uh, assigned uh, a Hacktoberfest label to 18 issues um, for a total of 331 uh, open issues. Uh, we tend to track whether uh, how we're doing on issue triage by uh, how many are how many are not assigned a milestone? So we have four issues currently not assigned a milestone. So we should definitely take a look at those. Make sure they're not um, blocking issues for 6.0. Uh, we do have one issue already marked as 6.0, so we'll have to take a look at that. 
And then we have uh, 18 issues that are marked as uh, 6.x, which are things that we want to do kind of like going forwards in 6, 6x series of releases. Um, overall, I would say, uh, you know, we're nearing the end of stabilizing 6.0. Uh, we're going to do another release candidate this week. I think I'll try to get it out today. Uh, there is one issue that I know is on Dan's radar, so it's possible we'll have another release candidate after that. Uh, but it do it couldn't hurt to get one out. Um, so I think we should do that. And we should also expect to see uh, 6.1 alpha or beta pretty soon around the same time uh, because there are some changes going into main that are not getting released. So. Uh, expect to see another pre-release alongside uh, once we have the 6.0 stable. Um, uh, that's where we're at uh, for the core. Thanks, Scott. <clears throat> mm -hmm. All right, next up is the libraries. So this applies to all of the CircuitPython libraries, which is any library that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore. Um, we had 14 pull requests merged by 10 authors and six reviewers. Uh, the oldest was two weeks, and a majority of them were zero or one days old, leaving us with 29 open pull requests. We have 13 issues closed by six people and nine open by nine people, so we're down, uh, for 214 open issues total. And we have Hacktoberfest label on nine issues, which means we have nine uh, good first issues. There was one new library, it looks like, in the last week. Uh, the MCP 2515, and a number of updated libraries. Um, in terms of the libraries, uh, if you are interested in this information um, or contributing to CircuitPython, the libraries are a great place to start. You can go to circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and um, uh, open issues, open PRs, and some library infrastructure issues. You can search the issues by label. Uh, good first issue is a great place to start if you're new to contributing um, at all. Uh, if you're looking for something a little more complicated, consider bug or enhancement, and it will bring up all of the issues that are labeled with um, any of those labels and give you a chance to uh, choose something. Or the other option is look at the open PRs, uh, see whether there's anything you have hardware for that you can test, or simply check it for syntax, that sort of thing. Say that you took a look at it. Um, it helps us out no matter how you, um, no matter how you help uh, review. Reviewing is always a great way to start as well. Um, overall, with the libraries, we are continuing to see more being contributed um, both to the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries and also the community bundle, which is excellent to see. Um, one of the new libraries that uh, we had recently anyway was the Monster Mask library. That was a community contributed library and that was excellent um, to have because we don't always uh, we don't always get um, community contributed libraries in the main bundle. So that was excellent to see. Um, so thank you to everybody who contributes to it. Um, please continue to do so and know that we are available to ha answer any questions uh, that you have. Um, and we want you to be able to contribute. So we are perfectly happy to help you out. And that's where we are with the libraries. So I will turn it over to Melissa to talk about Blinka. Hello, Blinka is our um, CircuitPython compatibility layer for Raspberry Pi and other single board computers. And this past week, there wasn't much done on it. Uh, there was a minor bug fix to the MCP2221, uh, where the I square C was not refreshing. Uh, error was going past the maximum number of retries. Um, so this week, we had two pull requests merged. Uh, by two authors and one reviewer. Uh, there were there are two open pull requests, and there were zero closed issues by zero people and zero open by zero people. Zero signed the Hacktoberfest label, and we have 26 open issues. There were 2,190 PyPI downloads in the last week, and we currently support 52 boards. And that's it. Excellent. Thank you. And that is the state of CircuitPython libraries and Blinka. 
Next up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the excellent things that folks are doing in the community. Um, it gives us a chance to call people out for doing awesome stuff, and there's a lot of awesome stuff happening, so this is always a nice uh, break. Um, it is held as a round robin, where I will start, and then uh, we will go down the list alphabetically. I will skip you if you are lurking. Um, if you're text only, I will read your notes. And um, if you're text only, I'll read your notes. And uh, if uh, you are going to read your own stuff off, I will hand it over to you when it's time. So with that, I will get started. Um, so first up, I have a hug report for John Park for feedback on my guide code. Um, I recently did a guide, which I'll talk about in status updates, wrote some code for it, um, wanted feedback on one section, which turns out was fine, but he ended up giving feedback on another thing that was excellent and slimmed down my code, um, made things a bit simpler. And that was always good because the code did get a little complicated. So it was nice to be able to slim something out of it. Um, I want to give a group hug to all the Discord community moderators. It's always refreshing to step away for the weekend and come back to everything running smoothly. And a group hug to the community. Um, things run smoothly because the community is amazing. And uh, thank you for continuing to be a positive, supportive, welcoming place to be. Uh, so next up is Maker Melissa, it looks like. Hello, let's see here. Okay, uh, I want to give a hug to Lady Eden PT for support since uh, I, we lost a family member here last week. Uh, I wanted to give a report to you, Kit, for reaching out to me as well. Um, I also wanted to get, I wanted to give a hug report to Brent for testing out my guide and for creating some for creating matrix portal projects and found a little issue with the library while he was doing that. Uh, I have a report to Dave Estelles for submitting a PR to add a missing feature to the Matrix Portal library and a group hug to everyone else. All right, excellent. Um, I'm not, yeah. MD Roberts, are you lurking today? Excellent. All right, then I have some notes from Mr. Certainly who says, a hug report to Tan Newt for an excellent deep dive on Friday, a big hug for the Adabox team for knocking 16 out of the park, and a group hug to everyone who makes this an open, friendly community. Next up is Scott. Hello. Uh, first, a hug report uh, for Z Walther for diving into CircuitPython and fishing, fixing issues. A hug report to Arachnid, who did PID.codes uh, for helping me get uh, everything caught up there um, and patiently replying to my emails. Uh, hug report to Kevin Thomas, Carter, Deshipu, Dan, Anik Data, and Jerry for helping with circuit help in help with CircuitPython as of uh, yesterday. And I, I'm sure I miss people, so sorry if I missed you. Uh, but thank you to all those folks in particular. And uh, last up, a uh, hug report to uh, Ivan. IGRR from Espresso for helping me uh, with some IDF spy issues that I hope to fix today. All right, excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. And next up is Zoltan. Uh, thanks, Katni. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge Jeff, uh, Jeff's uh, always prompt help. Uh, I have had some difficulties in the couple, uh, last couple of weeks with, um, with with GitHub, and he was always there uh, immediately and helped me out. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Scott for explaining uh, the, the background of the Adafruit learning system. I know that it, it was eons ago, um, and that time I wanted to, to keep a low profile, and that's why I actually raised the question on the text channel, but uh, Scott decided to pick it up from there and then um, gave uh, a an, an, an very enlightening explanation. Uh, next, um, a hug. 
to um, Kevin Walters for pointing out uh, an error in Microlab and then uh, actually digging a bit deeper. Uh, um, and it, it helped me uh, fix uh, this uh, particular issue. And finally, um, I would like to thank Syscon for lending a head, hand with, uh, with the Python stub or the MicroPython stubs. Uh, stubs. Um, um, I have been reworking the, um, um, the, the code base for Microlab. And I also wanted to update the documentation for that. And he, he uh, uh, gave me a hand there. So thanks for that. And that's, that's all from me. Excellent. Back, back to you, Skating. Thank you. Next up, I have some notes uh, from Ask Patrick W, who says, "Thanks to Anecdata and Kevin Thomas for helping me troubleshoot Wi-Fi on my ESP32 S2, especially since the issue was my build environment." Note: Make sure IDF is up to date. Next, I have notes from Charles, who says, "Group hug to all." And next up is Dan. Hi. So uh, as, as uh, Scott did, I'd also like to thank C. Walther, who has looked very carefully at some code that we had and uh, proposed a PR that fixed some tricky issues that were, it took some thinking, it took some considerable thinking and to figure out what was going wrong. I really appreciate his time that he spent on it. I'd like to thank two people who work on the Bleak library, which is a Python, uh, multi-platform uh, Python Bluetooth library that we use underneath uh, Adafruit Blinka BLAIO, uh, David Lechner and Hendrik Blit. And uh, they've, they've been fixing things very quickly in um, Bleak, which is really helpful for us. Thanks to Lady Ada, who's been reviewed several of my pull requests in like five minutes, which was really helpful <laughs> uh, when I was waiting for uh, a library change so I could put it in the guide. And thanks to Jeff for continuing to work on CanIO and making having a lot of success in that regard. Okay. Excellent. Next up, I have some notes from David Gloud, who has a hug report for all the people working on Nina FW, all the people working on the guide and library behind the Ada box, and all the people doing the Adafruit live streams and contributing to show and tell. And next up is Foamy Guy. All right, uh, this week, uh, firstly, I'm gonna go in the opposite order if anybody's uh, in the dock, but uh, Ask Patrick W, uh, actually for the last few weeks, has been chasing down some issues uh, that are basically uh, inside of Circup uh, when it's used with Python 3.9. So I know there was one that was inside Click, which is the library that is used for the command line interface uh, in that Circup tool. And then I know there's uh, some new stuff that came up after that in Pilot, and uh, Ask Patrick W has been really diligent about chasing that down uh, and getting it resolved in a bunch of different places. So really appreciate that. And then uh, it's outside of Circuit Python, but uh, GitHub user Philip L they created a, a utility for Linux called EvDev Remap Keys, which turned out to be uh, very, very, very helpful for me this week. It lets me remap some keys on some old macro pads I have so that I can actually use them, even though there's not a driver for it. So uh, that's got my productivity back up and I definitely really appreciate that. Uh, and that's all for me this week. Excellent. Thank you. Next up, I have notes uh, from Higher Effect, who says a hug report to Jeff Epler and Microdev for their work on ESP32 S2 CAN and Touch.io respectively, and a group hug. And next up is Jeff. Hello. Uh, first, I want to thank Jerry and Anecdata for helping me out and help with CircuitPython. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes think, oh, I need to be a, a professional and not ask for help. But I get to ask for help. And when I do, people answer. So that's wonderful. Uh, thanks to Christian Walther, C. Walther, that Dan also mentioned, mentioned for working on some highly technical issues in the core. Uh, thank you to Zoltan for Microlab updates and bug fixes that we will hopefully have in CircuitPython soon. A big welcome back to Hyra Effect. It's, uh, I'm glad you could take the time away, but we're happy to see you back. Thank you to Dan for figuring out the Nina firmware thing, which uh, he explained in the internal meeting what that was. And like, I don't even remember or understand what the explanation is, but it's fixed and that's amazing. Uh, thanks Katni for powering through a variety of technical and non-technical hurdles to get stuff done. And lastly, a group hug for everybody because I always forget somebody. 
All right. Thank you. Next up is Jerry. Yeah, hello. Um, just a big thank you to Dan for fixing the Nina firmware issue. Nice to have that working. Perfect. Perfect. And cool. that is Hug Reports. Next up is Status Updates. Status Updates is an opportunity for us to sync up on what we've been doing since the last meeting and what we're going to do until the next meeting. Um, take a couple minutes, tell us about what you've been working on. You can talk about uh, Python or CircuitPython related things, or just let us know what you've been up to. We've heard about people's bathroom remodeling before, and we're always uh, interested to know what everyone has going on. Um, so feel free to let us know what you did over the course of the last week, what you're going to be doing, and if you're up to anything fun, you can let us know that as well. Uh, status update is held as a round robin the same way that hug reports are. So I will start and then we'll go through the list alphabetically um, where I will read everybody off who is text only or lurking with notes and um, turn it over to the folks who are around. So with that, I will get started if I can find my place in the document and not type in the wrong place. There we go. All right, so uh, last week I published a Cutie Pie Activity Timer and Hydration Reminder Guide. Um, there's a link to it in the notes. Uh, basically, it's two NeoPixel rings with an accelerometer and a Cutie Pie suspended between them. And you plug it in, it starts a timer. Uh, so say you want to time uh, working two hours and then taking a 15 minute break. It'll count down the using um, the LEDs with a gradient so that it's not in your face. Um, counts it down and then you flip it and it continues um, on to the next activity. With the hydration reminder one, it just counts down an interval and then you flip it and it counts down the same interval. Um, it uh, was, was a fun build. Um, and I learned a lot writing the code, so that was excellent. Uh, so check that out um, if you're interested in either of those two things. Um, I did a couple of fritzing objects and some miscellaneous guide fixes uh, based on um, guide feedback. So just things that were missing from older guides, um, new products, or uh, if we the guide may have been written before we did things a certain way, so it was missing certain things. Um, this week I did an update, uh, but it's a lot of miscellaneous so far, but the thing that is my priority is there's a LC709203, which is too many numbers. Um, it's, a, it's a fuel gauge basically for your uh, lithium ion batteries that you can attach um, to say a feather and it will track the level of the battery. Um, there's no guide for it yet. So uh, that is what, um, or rather there's a guide for it, but there's no circuit Python code in the guide. So first up, I need to test the code and then um, once we verify it's working, uh, put the CircuitPython code and page in the guide. That way, if you have this product and you want to use it with CircuitPython, uh, the guide will have you covered. Uh, other than that, I have a few fritzing objects to do. Um, like I said, a bunch of miscellaneous. Um, and that's pretty much what's going on with me. So not a lot of, um, not a lot going on. Um, anyway, next up is, wait for it. Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, last week I wrote a guide for creating matrix portal projects. Um, I started working on an e-ink guide overhaul and I added the grayscale e-ink pages. I tested some e the EPD library or doing no EPD library refactor updates since it is it now supports grayscale and uh, same thing with the image reader library. I fixed a matrix portal issue when you used multiple fonts, and I updated another guide's uh, PyTFT installation instructions, because there's actually like about five of them or something. And this week I'm going to continue working on e guide updates, which should get faster and faster, and I need to update a, the remaining PyTFT installation instructions. And while I was reading this, I remembered one more thing I'm going to work on, which is I need to add 
some voice bonded instructions to a uh, Google Assistant guide I did last week. And that's it. Excellent. Thank you. Next up is Mark. Unless Mark is text only. Yeah, sorry, I didn't put that in oh. there. Okay. But I'm actually here, so. Excellent. Do you want to read it <laughs> off or do you want me to? Uh, you can just read it off because I don't have it in front of me at the moment. Okay, will do. So last week, working on moving the bus device library to the core. This week, writing my first ever status update, excellent, and working on finishing moving bus device to the core. Um, next, I have notes for microdev. Who says, last week I worked on the native touch IO implementation for the ESP32 S2. And this week I plan to take a look at the audio IO and rotary IO for the S2. Excellent. And next up is Scott. Hello. Um, Microdev, take a look at rotary IO. I think uh, Jeff is going to look at audio IO. Uh, we just talked about that. Uh, that's next on Jeff's list, I think. So uh, for myself, I add a, I'm working on adding Grayscale ePaper support to the core. Uh, I want to test it today with NRF and then make a PR. Uh, I did find an issue with Spy on the ESP32 S2, uh, which I think somebody was saying like, oh, the, or I think, yeah, Bruce S, I think said that it sounds like the issue I had with the display. So it might be a larger issue than just e-ink. Um, but what it looks like, I, I got the logic analyzer out and it transmits the correct number of bytes, but all the bytes are zero, <laughs> not the values they should be. So uh, I contacted Ivan IGRR and uh, sounds like he he gave me a lead and they're going to fix it in the IDF eventually, but I should be able to, to try it and see if I can't get it working as well. Uh, so I'm going to look at that today. Um, I'll also probably take a look at an RC1 today or tomorrow. Um, if there's any, I don't think that it's going to be actually the stable release we want um, because of uh, the REPL issue on CMD that some folks are seeing. But I think uh, if that's not going to be fixed uh, imminently, then we should get a new RC out anyway. Um, and generally, we need to get to stable soon, sooner rather than later. Um, so I'm thinking about that. Uh, I also have grayscale changes to the IL0373 driver um, that I want to get checked in as well and potentially fixed up. And then lastly, I was taking a look at bare metal Raspberry Pi over the weekend. It looks very doable. Um, so that's going to not be something I do, do during the week, but something that may stick on my radar. Uh, as something that is just a palate cleanser from all this ESP32 S2 work. Um, so that's where I'm at. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next up is Zoltan. Uh, thanks, Katni. So in the past couple of weeks, I have been busy with um, fixing code for Microlab. I, I set my goals uh, several weeks ago, but I sort of underestimated the effort required to <laughs> achieve those goals. Um, all the same, I think I, I have fixed all outstanding issues related to the code. Um, so I am basically ready to, to release 1.0 in, uh, in the next couple of days. Um, the, the only remaining um, uh, issue is the, the documentation. I really would like to uh, incorporate the the, the, the material in the Python stubs. So I, I, I would have to work out how I insert that. Um, and in, if, if I still have time, um, then I would like to factor out a couple of um, uh, uh, functions into a reusable form. A uh, couple of people uh, wanted to have something that, that they could use uh, sort of independent of, of Microlab. So for example, if you, if you just wanted to calculate the Fourier transform of something, uh, but you don't want to take the, the whole package, um, <clears throat> Then at the moment you can't do that because the the uh, Fourier transform kernel is actually part of uh, Microlab, um, but I think this is a reasonable request. So I, I would like to would like to fulfill that, and um, if if I have time, then then I I will factor out uh, at least a couple of functions and and see where it goes. So that's it from me. All right, thank you. 
Next up, I have notes from Charles, who says, working on a MIDI auto harp, going to try and do it on a Metro M4 in CircuitPython. And next up is Dan. Okay. So um, first of all, I um, the Adafruit Blinka BLEIO library, which lets you use um, BLEIO stuff on host computers. I retested that because I kind of lost track of what was working and what wasn't and um, found out what didn't work and did work um, and found some issues with the, the underlying bleak library, which I mentioned previously that we used. So um, I got that all straightened out and then they had made a new release and broke something in Mac OS and I asked them to fix it and they fixed it right away, which is really nice. So uh, right now it's everything is working nicely. Um, I wrote a guide which is uh, being uh, in moderation right now, which means that it's being edited basically, uh, describing how to use uh, Blinka BLEIO on, on Mac OS and Linux, including Raspberry Pi and Windows. And there's a bunch of short examples. So you'll see that guide in print soon. And I had to fix some libraries because I discovered bugs as I was working on the examples. Um, we have uh, the firmware that runs on the Airlift processors, which is the ESP32, not the ESP32-S2. ESP32 is just a coprocessor that we use on like the Pi Portal and the Airlift Lite, and there's a breakout for it. That, which is normally used for Wi-Fi, it can also support uh, Bluetooth. And so I had... Um, written uh, through something called HCI. So I had written a, an HCI version of BLEIO, which is now in most platforms on most most larger builds in CircuitPython. But the firmware, we had a working version of the firmware that um, uh, Moore had developed, but we couldn't reproduce the build. Somehow the pull request that came in did not work. And so I spent a couple of days looking at this and found the bug. It was just an infinite loop in a wrong place. I think it was there for debugging reasons that it hadn't been removed. So that build is now working and there's a new version of the Nina FW firmware, version 1.7.1, which you can download if you wanna try this. But I'll be writing some more guide pages describing how to use HCI BLEIO uh, soon. And that's what I'm working on in the next few days. And then I'll get back to trying to get uh, the 6.0 release out and also fix some things, some some bugs that we're going to fix post the release. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Next, I have some notes from David, who has an empty space and says, the place above is intentionally blank, nothing noticeable I could remember this week. And next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, for last week, let's see here. Let me get to the right spot. Um, I got a couple of jack o' lantern eyes uh, created for the monster mask. I made some star eyes and some triangle eyes, and I experimented with having them shift around back and forth uh, so the pumpkin can look around while it's sitting there, which is kind of fun. Um, I also tested out a couple of pull requests. I think one was uh, on the Pi Portal for um, the Pi Portal library specifically, and it was allowing the text to be scaled so that the different labels that get shown on the screen can have different sizes. And then uh, another one on the progress bar, there was a bug that was related to uh, overriding the width and height properties, specifically on, uh, on Blinka uh, of the tile grid. It, it extends tile grid, and it turned out to be a problem on Blinka that didn't exist in the um, in uh, the microcontroller, so somebody made a PR to fix that and tested it out. Um, and then uh, really the main thing that has occupied my time is I got a new computer, made have made the jump over to Linux, and so I'm still, uh, as you can imagine, getting the, in the process of getting everything um, set up and, and back to how I want it and all my apps and everything. So uh, I have made a, a successful build of CircuitPython on there, so that's good. Um, and I'm getting closer, I feel, to being done, but um, that's still taking up some of my time. Uh, for next week, I want to get that jack-o'-lantern code and the assets put into the Monster Mask repo as an example, uh, maybe work on a few more for that as well. And then um, 
the uh, the class I was teaching in the evenings is over now again. So uh, I'm going to get back to trying to work on the the tutorials for Circuit Playground, uh, and that's what I got for next week. Thanks, Katie. Excellent. Thanks, Tim. Uh, next up is I have notes for higher effect. Last week, vacation and projects. This week, back to it. Summoned for a quest, implementing RMT on the ESP32 Arduino. Uh, some ESP32 S2 reviews of CAN and TouchIO, STM32 TouchIO. Fix the F1 port, which is stalled. And then RTC, Rotary IO, and Crypto IO planning. And next up is Jeff. Ooh, Crypto IO. That sounds kind of spooky. Uh, so last week, the bulk of my time was working on the ESP32-S2 CAN-IO implementation. Uh, the state of it at the end of last week was that transmission worked, but I hit bugs with setting message reception filters. And so I reproduced that in a sample program that ships with the ESP-IDF and discovered that to make that problem happen, you had to turn on uh, optimization. So I filed a bug against ESP-IDF. And I found a workaround that we could incorporate into CircuitPython without requiring a change to the ESP IDF. But I want to stress that it's only a workaround. Um, even so, I did go ahead and um, put that in our pull request and set that to ready for review. So that will go in to the main branch, uh, hopefully sometime soon. I went through feedback on my guides on learn.adafruit.com and found some things to improve. So that was. Um, a helpful use of my time. I finished up and it is now live, my calculator, RPN calculator with CircuitPython guide. And I filed a PR to update MicroLab. And I did some work in MicroLab so that their CI builds against CircuitPython and MicroPython uh, instead of just MicroPython as it did before. And this will be helpful because usually uh, CircuitPython will have a different uh, set of diagnostics that it will encounter during the build. And if those are deferred until we want to update it, Update micro, update micro lab within CircuitPython, uh, then that creates extra steps. And hopefully next time that won't happen. Anyway, uh, this week I had written that I was looking for a fix or workaround for the message reception filter problem, but we have the workaround in place. So next up, uh, my focus will be investigating ESP32S2 uh, audio out, either using the DAC or using the uh, I2S. And I think that what we decided in the internal meeting was to start with I2S and then move to the um, analog audio out as a second item. Uh, so that's going to be some reading the data sheet, reading the ESP IDF documentation, and then getting down and writing some code. And uh, so as far as fun stuff, I made a air quality sensor for my father-in-law, who uh, we do see on the weekends. And I learned that cooking waffles and cinnamon apples will raise the air quality index in your kitchen to 80 or above. So uh, be careful. It's uh, a dangerous environment. You might need to wear some personal protective equipment. Uh, and that's all for me. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Next, up Jerry. Next up is Jerry. Hi. Um, so a couple of little things. Um, uh, I added uh, support for the LED that's built into the R503 fingerprint sensor. It's got this great little LED that around the uh, they call it the aura uh, around the thing, but the library just didn't didn't have any access to it. And um, this is an example of something that came up. It was really easy fix, but uh, it came up in a discussion on the forum, and um, that, that it wasn't that it wasn't there. So just went in and put it in, and it's kind of fun to have it. But uh, it was a good example of you know I I I I spent a lot of time reading the forums and I learn a lot by doing that and see a lot getting a lot of great ideas and little things pop up that oh that, that's something I can do so that was fun uh, and actually the next one was a similar thing um, somebody pointed out that there was they were having trouble using SPI on a circuit playground uh, blue fruit and it turns out there was actually a typo or a bug in the and the pin definitions for the default SPI pins. So I fixed that, and um, and it's 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 in the 60x branch. I don't think it's in main yet, but it it, it made it. If you try to use board.spi on the Bluefruit, it didn't work. So that's fixed. And then then just did a little playing around with the new Nina Nina build. Uh, it was nice to uh, actually be able to build it and uh, get it to work. Now I got a bunch of boards to try it in. So. So I'll try and do some of that this week. 
Jerry, did you take a look at the SSL search stuff at all? Just briefly, I didn't get anywhere with it yet, but that's on my on my radar as well. Okay, because it we could probably have higher factor Dan look at it maybe. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, actually, you know, I, I I I took a look, but it was you know I didn't make any progress at all. So if somebody else okay. wants to look at it, they more than welcome to. Not yeah. immediately, but potentially. Okay, soon. I'll see if I can get anywhere with it, but uh, yeah, it's okay. it's pretty deep in there. <laughs> yep. Okay. All right. And that is status updates. So that means next up is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions or questions unrelated to status updates, um, stuff that we uh, anybody wants to talk about. Um, it can get pretty deep. We put it at the end so that if uh, folks are interested in the rest of the meeting, but I uh, would rather not get into the weeds. Uh, you don't have to. You can listen up till now and then uh, skip the rest. But um, it's an important uh, section for us. So what I will be doing is uh, there are three topics listed. Um, I will be turning it over to each of those folks to talk about their topic. And uh, everyone who wants to can participate, um, ask questions, help out, that kind of thing. So first up. Uh, I'll turn it over to Dan. So uh, this is just a kind of a procedural question, I think for Mel Melissa mainly. That So this, the notes for the meeting and the report in the meeting include an Adafruit Blinka section. Does that also include Adafruit Blinka display IO? And if so, should it also include like Adafruit Blinka BLE IO and maybe more libraries as it gets added? As far as I know, it just includes Adafruit Blinka, and it, there's a lot more it should be including, like Platform Detect, Pure IO, uh, B, uh, Blinka Display IO, BLE Blinka, and all that. So, so is that? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, file an issue on the Adabot repo. Okay. And okay, um, there might already be one there. I'm not sure. Okay, if there if there is. Um, please make sure that it has a list of what you'd like to see okay. included. Um, I don't know who or when that um, will pick it up or when it'll get picked up, but that's where we need to have that information so that um, we get everything we want in that info. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Yep. All right. That answers that question. Uh, so next up, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Zoltan. Thanks, Katni. So I would have three, um, hopefully short questions. Um, the first one is, um, is there a one-liner that uh, turns uh, Python stubs uh, directly into restructured text? Not that I know of. Okay. You'd have to look and see how Sphinx does it with auto API, okay. is what we use to do it. But mm -hmm. it's RST is really an intermediary in that case. OK. Um, next question is, um, um, if, if, if I have nested functions, uh, how can I um, measure the, uh, the RAM consumption? So let's suppose I, I have a function that has somewhere deep inside uh, an if clause, and one of the branches calls uh, function A, uh, the other one calls function B. Um, how much RAM is going to be consumed. Um, on a PC, you don't usually care about such things, but, um, but, but on a microcontroller, it might be a different issue. So right. are, there, are there tools uh, to, to, to dig this piece of information out? Not currently that I know of. Basically, what you're going to do with function calls is you, with 6.0, you'll, you'll pay a cost on the Pi stack and the C stack. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where all the RAM will end up. Um, okay. there are not methods to get like the current, like how deep you are on those two stacks. Um, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be too hard to add if you're curious, but, um, I don't know of anything, uh, exposed to Python to do it. Um, it can be C. So I, this, this is purely for, um, um, debugging purposes. I, I, I don't care if it's, uh, 
if, even if it's in, in assembly, that's that's also okay. Uh, I just I just want to print it out uh, uh, at a time when I am testing it, mm -hmm. uh, and after that, it could be could be yanked from the code. I, so I don't the, care about it. Yeah. So the C stack, you could just read the stack pointer, and that will tell you how far down you are in in that okay. region. Mm -hmm. um, I assume there's an equivalent variable for the pi stack. I just don't know what it is off the okay. top of my head because pi stack is managed by the VM. Mm -hmm. um, but like all of your function arguments and stuff get allocated to the pi stack now. In uh, circuit Python, right? Yeah. Okay. And MicroPython, if pi stack is enabled, but that mm -hmm. varies per port, I think. Okay. Um, and the the last question is how pedantic uh, should one be about uh, local variables uh, when, um, when raising an exception. So um, I, I realized that in, in some of the functions in Microlab, um, I have to raise the exception uh, somewhat late uh, in the function because because simply I don't know beforehand uh, mm -hmm. whether, whether uh, the arguments, the input arguments are going to fulfill some criterion. Um, so um, um, before I am ra raising the exception, um, there are quite a few local variables um, uh, created by MU. And the question is whether they would have to be freed before before um, getting out of the function, or or is it okay, okay if if I am if I if I leave them there dangling and then uh, the, um, the the garbage collector will take care of that later on? How 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 dangerous uh, dangerous is, is it to to rely on the garbage collector in this sense? I think it's okay to have the use the garbage collector to have your back. Um, mm -hmm. just one gotcha can be that like, because we pick pointers off the stack, if you have local copies of the pointer on the stack, that could actually mean that those pointers live longer than you intended. Okay. Um, so, so that should be cleaned up. You could clean it up. There's no, like it's, it's fine to rely on the garbage collector, but you could also clean it up and it'd be okay too. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the, the, the garbage collector doesn't doesn't uh, do anything before before it is due to do something, right? So um, that, that 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 could be much much later. Um, so um, perhaps the question is um, whether it's okay to 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 let these these local variables live so long. I think after, it's uh, after I think fact. it's fine because okay. the allocator also <laughs> has like minimum boundaries that it's going to start looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you free that hole, like it's not going to re, I don't think it resets the boundary to start when it looking for allocations at, so okay. I don't think there may not actually be any benefit to doing it, uh, early. Well, uh, it has throwbacks, <laughs> uh, because if you, if you specifically free up, uh, uh the, uh, the, the RAM or these, uh, get rid of these, these uh, local variables, then then the firmware gets bigger. So if you if you say that it's perfectly fine to to let them live, yep. then then I can I can actually reduce the code size a bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thanks a lot. So with that back uh, back to you, Katni. All right. Excellent. So lastly, we have a topic from Jerry. Yeah, and my apologies if this was discussed before. I, I just may have missed it. That was on, on the bus device moving in the core. That would be really neat. My question is, Is do you think that will go into the small builds, or is that only going to be a big build thing? I suspect it will not go into the small builds, except for the builds that already freeze it in. OK, so that was um, my, my other question is, is specifically on that. Um, and it is, is the intent for it to be, you know, the API to be the same so that it's transparent to the, to the, to those yes. or is that... okay. Well, That's good. my goal is basically it's the same exact library. It's just implemented in C and not in Python. Cool. Okay. Which and, will okay. speed it, it up be... and make it smaller, hopefully. But, okay. So it should be usable on those small builds. I'm thinking like the RFM 9X, the, the, uh, I guess it'd be the CPX as well that have it built in. It, it should be able to be used in those. Yeah, I mean, I I assume that oh. the C code is going to be smaller than the frozen bytecode. Okay, that'll be fun. All right, I'll keep an eye on it. Check it out. 
Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's one of the, one of those core libraries. I think is going to be actually very nice to have yeah. in the core. Yeah. And just yeah, right now I'm trying to copy exactly what the Python's doing and determine if any of that's not required later. Right. Can I know? Mm-hmm. Will that have? I will. I'm working on um, in my auto harp. I have to create three different. Uh, th Three different. Uh, it when you create a open uh, an I two C address, mm -hmm. that will multiple I two C addresses on one bus. Will that affect? Any, uh, will that what you're doing affect anything I'm doing? Because I need uh, that. For the harp. No, so answers. it should just import the native version if you have the native version available. Okay, um, that's all I wanted to know. It won't, that means it won't screw up anything. No, it's... You're, you're keeping the same uh, uh, API. It shouldn't matter. Right. And and to be clear, Mark is working on it, not me. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's the, the goal is straight up, like, it's such a critical library to all our drivers. And we had some questions about, like, how long it took to assert CS lines and stuff that when Mark asked, uh, hey, what can I do in the core? I was like, hey, you can move this into the core. Um, it's it's more complicated than the other work that Mark's done, but like still pretty so tractable. Pretty so, tractable so. I think yeah. it's a good, think it's a good, a good, thing, to good do. thing to do. And one of the things that I think I'm, I'm correct in this, that if, when testing it, you have to make sure that if, it, if it's in the file system, the, the path search, I believe, takes the file system first before the before the core. Is that correct? I don't remember. Because I, I think that was the case. That way, that, that was so so that you could override, you know, put put a, a test case in there. To, otherwise, there'd be no way to, you know, to test something. <laughs> but that's with frozen that's modules. Crazy. I'm not sure. I don't know if that's true for uh, native, native modules. OK. Oh, oh, that's true. OK. Good. All right. Well, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see first, see as well. OK, good. Right, but thanks. I mean, the AP, the API of it has been so stable that it should be fine. Oh yeah, no, I just meant it. Just meant it, it, it. I was worried that we'd have to make sure we pull it out of the builds and have it built in before before it'll actually get used. So that was that right. was the right. thing I just wanted to check. I thanks. think native so, modules just win. Just win. Good. <laughs> so as, that, they as they should. So that means so that, means, that means, basically means that if I open multiple multiple objects of one driver. It shouldn't be affected. It should still operate the same way it always does. Yeah. It, the only thing that's going to be different is when you do import Adafruit bus device, it'll just give you the native module object instead of loading it from the file system. Yeah. Uh, I, in other words, uh, you, what you would do is basically take it out of the lib uh, lib directory and let the native native take over. Yeah, but I think that even if you have it in your library directory, it won't be loaded if the native one's available. OK. That's cool. Yeah, that's, which should be that's fine. That's interesting to see uh, see the improvement, hope, the hope for improvement. Yeah, I'm curious to see how that goes, too. Yeah, because yeah, basically uh, what, I, what I'm doing is I'm using a uh, time to flight sensor so that I can use it to simulate plucking the strings. Mm. Neat. So it needs to respond pretty as quickly as possible. So yeah, I, I'll actually be, uh, actually if I use try it on six zero release uh, whatever release candidate is most up to date. It should. Well, it's not in the core yet, so it won't go no, in six zero. No, I'm saying for. To, to, to have something to compare to when it is yep. in the core. Right. That's what I'm talking about. Exactly, yeah. OK, excellent. Yeah. And I think with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, this has been the CircuitPython Weekly for October 26th, 2020. Um, this has been uh, the time of the week where we talk about all things CircuitPython and get a chance to sync up and um, talk about uh, what we've been up to.
So thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, uh, those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from Adaf the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. Uh, again, the video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Uh, visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held on Monday, I believe, as usual, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, the meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord, and we are available there all week as well. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonista's role on Discord. And with that, we hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>